today's redevelopment agency board meeting for this 12th of December, 2023. Our meetings are public and you're welcome to join us in person on Zoom or by watching from the City Council's agenda page, Facebook, YouTube, or SLC TV. We hope you'll continue to join us whichever manner you feel most comfortable. We begin our meeting with comments to the board. And I'd like to remind that you, are, uh, you that written comments may be submitted to the RDA office via mail at PO Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah 84115, excuse me, 84114, or emailing us at council.comments at slcgov.com or calling our 24 hour nine, 801 535 7654. And thank you for joining us. And before we start, I just want to remind everyone about our rules of decorum, which are in place to ensure our meetings move along well and to help everyone feel comfortable sharing their comments. A copy of the full rules of decorum are available at the door, and our staff will post them link on, in Zoom. If you'd like to make a general comment today, we are accepting comments in person or online on Zoom. Scott Corpany from our staff will moderate our Zoom and will message you with any questions about your registration. If you need to speak with our staff, please select Scott from the list of participants. If you need to, and you can also raise your hand in Zoom to indicate that you need something from the host. Staff is handling many tasks, so please limit the message to technical issues and limit uh, minimal informational updates. Taylor Hill on our staff will be calling those who wish to com comment Based on the order, we receive the names. If you are on Zoom, please unmute your mic when Taylor calls your name. Uh, and we have on online, we have Councilmember Pui and Councilmember Young will be online, and uh, Councilmember Valdemoros and Councilmember is absent. Uh, and Taylor, we are now open to our general comments, so Taylor, please start our first comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have one person registered. That is Isabel Kinney Kinney. Isabel, you may now unmute. Isabel, can you hear us? Um, I will message with Isabel and we can get her comments written because it looks like there are some technical difficulties. Okay, thank you. We're on to item number B, which is a public hearing. There are no public hearings. And now we're on to the redevelopment agency business. And our first item is a resolution, the housing and transit and reinvestment zone tax increment reimbursement policy program policy. Let me, I want to try that one more time to see if I can put them all together. Housing and Transit Reinvestment Zone Tax Increment Reimbursement Program Policy. Okay, spelling test later. At the desk, we have Allison Rowland, our Council Policy Analyst. We have uh, Kara Lindsay, the Deputy Director of RDA, and uh, Lauren Parisi, the uh, Program Manager, Senior Program Manager. Allison, it's all yours. Be heard on this. Thanks, Cindy Lou. Uh, so this is your third briefing on the proposed HTRZ. I won't even try it. The <laughs> proposed HTRZ policy, more specifically the tax increment reimbursement policy for new RDA areas of this type. The RDA requested that RDA staff requested that the board approve a policy specific to HTRZ tax increment because these zones are subject to different requirements and they're regulated by a separate section of state code than our traditional RDA areas. State law recently changed to allow municipalities to establish HTRZs near public transit facilities to encourage mixed use affordable housing development and increase public transit use. Taxing entities would continue to receive the same amount of tax revenue that was generated before the creation of the HTRZ, and a share of the tax receipts can be used by the city to help fund increased infrastructure, transportation needs, and water costs. This HTRZ tax increment policy would serve as policy guidance for negotiation and distribution of revenue among specific projects after applications are approved by the state. 
In exchange for a share of tax increment, participating developments must provide significant public benefits. The board reserves the right to modify or deny a tax increment reimbursement application at any time for any reason. This is on the agenda for potential action today. Uh, there are a few policy questions included in the staff report on this related to the qualifying livability benchmarks and whether these are balanced among the amount of effort that, that would be required from developers to meet these, these different livability benchmarks. And then also a, a policy question on the length of deed restrictions, which is recommended as 30 years, but the thriving in place uh, plan that you recently approved uh, actually recommends 99 years or in perpetuity. That's it. I'll turn it over to Lauren and Kara. Thanks, Allison. I did have one slide, if we could pull that up. Great, thank you. And we can move right to the first um, slide there. So in addition to what Allison has described, I'd just like to go over um, as a refresher the thresholds in this policy. Um, in order to qualify for a tax increment reimbursement. Um, so the thresholds require that all projects meet the standards of the state's HTRZ Act, um, that they include activated ground floor spaces that's not in exclusive to the tenants in the building, um, that they meet the RDA sustainable development policy, and that they they provide evidence that tax increment is necessary for their project to succeed or that there is financial need, essentially. For projects that incorporate housing, at least 10% of the units must be affordable at 60% of the area median income or below, or we provide the option that 20% of the units could be affordable at 80% AMI or below. Um, projects must also follow any specific conditions set by the state HTRZ committee. So in the case of the 900 South HTRZ, the state is requiring a higher level of affordability or 20% of the units at 60% AMI. So just something to note that if that committee does have conditions, we also must follow those. Um, and then finally, for commercial projects, our policy will require that they incorporate at least two of the qualifying livability benchmarks. And if we could switch to the next slide. So I did want to um, mention that not all of the livability, the RDA's livability benchmarks have been included um, in this policy um, or would allow projects to qualify for a tax increment reimbursement. Only those that are bolded here on the screen have been included as we felt that these are of equal caliber in terms of um, implementation. So for example, walkability requires projects to create new publicly accessible connections through this site or um, make significant enhancements um, to uh, the public way. And then something like public art requires that a certain percentage of the RDA's contribution go to art and the RDA can set that percentage um, to ensure that it's a meaningful contribution. So those are just examples of the two of two qualifying livability benchmarks that um, someone could incorporate in a project to receive a reimbursement. So um, that's just kind of a high level uh, overview. So please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you, Lauren. Any questions for Lauren? I just have a couple on the, uh, the, the benchmarks. And I remember when we went through these benchmarks and, and the definitions of them. So, Oh, on the one that you just talked about, the public art, that's not public art being uh, displayed in the area or just public funding to the public arts uh, program? It's, it's public art that needs to be incorporated in their private project. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then on the, uh, when we talk about affordable commercial spaces, what did, how did we define affordable? I mean, did a What's the level there? That's a great question, and that's something I think we would work through administratively if a project does come in that's kind of that wants to implement something that like that. It's kind of new to us, but we would look and um, do some research on uh, market rate commercial leases, and then kind of go from there to ensure that those are uh, leased out at an affordable rate okay. for and the area. I guess I'm kind of like hitting on all of them. Like the, the permanent job creation is that one full time position 
uh, or is it a an hourly position? Is it a staff? I mean, how how are we defining what a permanent job creation is? Yeah. So I'll just um, read the criteria we have here. So the project uh, and tr attracts employers as permanent occupants that provide or retain jobs at or above a living wage, and the project must um, retain at least one full-time job per fifty thousand dollars of received program funding. Okay, great, great. So there's there is a specific yeah, which is we nice. do have specific criteria for for all of these. I think some of them could be tweaked a little to ensure that they're um, they're meeting our standards. Yeah, but think, yeah, because I don't want them to be I want them to be, be achievable, but I don't want them to be just easy. Right, and, right, and exactly. If, especially if they're going to be able to meet two of them. Uh, right now, we're weighing them all the same. Yep, all equal weight. Yep, we pulled out the ones that we felt were all of an equal weight, and we're saying if you meet the two of those, in addition to those first thresholds yeah, right, right, right. about sustainability, et cetera, yeah. And, and then they can also get additional tax increment if they meet additional ones above the threshold. Exactly, yeah. I think those are uh, great questions. As far as the, the deed restriction of 30 years by 99 years, by, what was it, 50 years or something? I'm yeah, it's in the, the RDA has recommended 30 years. Um, and Thriving in Place recommends 99 years or in perpetuity. So there's a, quite a bit of a difference. And then 30 years, is that pretty much standard for all of our RDA type programs? Or is it that it's a starting point? Okay. I guess I really don't. The, I, I think the argument, just to elaborate a little, I think the argument in Thriving in Place is that it's important to be able to conserve uh, properties that are already affordable, to be able to conserve them for the longer run, and they didn't consider 30 years a very long run. Um, it's longer for some of us than others. Gotcha. And I, I do believe that the 30 years is consistent with what the states um, establish, and it could potentially be more difficult for projects to attract private funding if there is that longer affordability period. I definitely think it's something that we will encourage projects to to try to do, um, but just for to add some information. Yeah, because we should at least meet the state's requirement. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're seeing right now is at 30 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any Further questions? Because we will be looking for a motion, or I will be looking for a motion. All right. So, yes, go ahead. Mr. Chair, I move that the board adopt the resolution adopting the housing transit reinvestment zone tax increment reimbursement program policy. I believe I said that right. You did. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion from uh, board member Mono, a second from board member Petro. Any questions on this motion? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, that motion passes six to zero with Councilmember Baldomoros absent. Thank you. Moving on to item number two, the resolution of 900 South Housing HTRZ and Interlocal Agreement. We have Allison still here, Danny. Walls, director, Orm is still here, Parisi from the senior project, and uh, we have Kate, the project manager. Hi. Great, thank you. Oh, we'll pass it on to Allison. Thanks, uh, just as soon as I pull it up, someone was distracting me. <laughs> just a brief reminder to put the microphone very close. Thank you. Okay, sorry for the delay. Um, a lot of files, it turns out. So this is a actually the third briefing, I believe, on the proposed 900 South HTRZ and uh, the corresponding draft interlocal agreement between the RDA and Salt Lake City Corporation. The first, this is the first HTRZ, and it would include areas of the Granary District, Central Ninth, and part of downtown. It's a total of 175 non-contiguous parcels on nearly 98 acres. The estimated number of new housing units is over 10,000, 
and it would include over 2,000 new units affordable at 60% AMI or less. Other land uses would include commercial, office, hotel, and structured parking. The goals of RDA involvement are to create a denser transit-oriented development resulting in a mixed-use mixed neighborhood to ensure varying levels of housing affordability and to minimize impacts on air quality for the neighborhood and for the whole region. There's no need to vote on this today. In fact, RDA staff con discussions continue with the Utah Tax Commission, the uh, Salt Lake County, and other taxing entities involved. The RDA staff plans to transmit a final version of the interlocal agreement between the city and RDA, and a draft of this is included in attachment A of the current transmittal. And following, just so you know about following steps, um, it would, after board adoption of the interlocal agreement, an ordinance to approve the interlocal agreement would be transmitted to the council. So you essentially sign the agreement on both sides, once as RDA members and then a second time as council members. That's all I have. Thank you, Allison. Um, we have a few slides prepared, if you wouldn't mind opening those. So as Allison mentioned, um, at um, the Housing and Transit Reinvestment Zone Committee, or HTRZ Committee for the state, uh, conditionally approved this um, HTRZ application on November 8th. If you want to go ahead and go to the next slide. This is the motion. Um, I'm not going to read it. It's quite long. But this is the conditional approval motion that, that was provided. Our, our goal today, we have three, three goals um, with this memo, is to provide first a, brief, a briefing on what steps are required in order to move forward with an interlocal agreement. Second, um, provide you that draft interlocal agreement that would be approved at a future meeting via resolution by the RDA board. And third, um, provide that same um, draft interlocal agreement that you would approve as the city council um, via ordinance. Um, if we want to go ahead and move on to the next slide. So the HTRZ application that was submitted is referenced um, throughout the memo as the HTRZ plan. This provides a guiding document, it is a guiding document for what was approved um, within, within the application and um, what we are looking forward to seeing occur in this area. At, at the top of this slide, you can see uh, different plans that were used with the creation of the 900 South HTRZ plan. Um, the main the main document that we looked to was the downtown plan. Um, there was a plethora of information on um, the needed infrastructure um, and and whatnot improve not improvements needed for this area. Within that interlocal agreement, um, it will be calling out different elements that that you will be approving um, and were approved by the HTRZ committee and. Um, you, you can see them here. As Allison mentioned, we have just under 98 acres and um, a few other items. Um, the participation rate is agreed to by the committee it's, itself. This, and in order to receive the funds um, per um, Utah State Code Section 63N, um, the city and the RDA are required to enter into this interlocal agreement. Um, and that will provide the funds to come to, to the RDA so that they can be incorporated into city plan um, projects and also private development here. Um, on here, I, I, we include the collection pre period. Um, an adjustment that was made was one, one phase of 15 years. I have a star there because they did include in that conditional approval that if something changes in the legislation, that can go up to 17 years. Um, you can see with the use of funds, we have it divided up into private development support, public development support, and RDA administration costs. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, at the top of the slide, you can see the different land uses that are pr proposed. Um, these are projections and are, are what would be anticipated if, if development occurred at the highest and best use, along with um, projects that are already underway or, or planned. Um, we, we are excited about that affordable housing unit count. And as Lauren mentioned, um, that would, we are projecting that to be 
an average of 20% um, of the units at 60% AMI. So that, that's great. Um, the, the HTRZ plan included um, focus areas for support for the, the tax increment. As you can see here, um, state law al allows for um, support of vertical and horizontal development and as well as affordable housing. So this is just a, a little bit more detailed list of what vertical and horizontal development we, we would consider and were included in the plan. Um, utility improvements, streetscape and safety improvements, sustainable building construction, and um, structured parking are on there, as well as public transit support and other public benefits as presented by Lauren. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Here we have a proposed schedule. Um, we are still um, negotiating with, with um, Salt Lake County and the Utah State Tax Commission and we have plans to meet with them again in January. Our initial meeting with them went well, and we anticipate things going very smoothly and a partnership agreement being um, finalized soon. Um, but we are not sure quite yet when that will be finalized, so um, future meetings are when the ordinance and resolution will be presented for your approval. And with that, we'll go to the next slide, and I'll turn it back over to Council or RDA Board Member Dugan. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Any questions for Kate? I just on the on the uh, there's one policy question in there. Our staff reports talks about the uh, the need for infrastructure on uh, pavements and utilities. And if you go back to that one slide, most of the development is on the northwest corner of the pie. And that has a lot of, uh, doesn't have a lot of housing out there right now. So the utilities are probably different. The, there are no probably sidewalks. There are no any curbs or anything else like that. So how does that uh, play into the whole district growth? And uh, how does that differ from any other uh, RDA areas that have that uh, already in place? So um, this, this map shows it pretty well, but on the eastern side, that, the, the State Street project area is, covers um, by, by State Street. I believe it's both sides of State Street. And um, then, it takes in a lot of a lot of that area. Um, we anticipate this funding being used to enhance. So in the Central Ninth area, we we um, help support um, that that um, project there. I I would anticipate that based on how the RDA board uh, approves of future projects, that we would facilitate enhancing and going above and beyond what the city standards are for. For pedestrian access I, I would also add so the tax increment is coming from the parcels that are highlighted in blue but we can spend the tax increment on public infrastructure kind of anywhere within this zone in the circle and so you know if according to city plans engineering transportation if there's a need outside or within the circle like outside of this blue area we could, you know, use funds that way as well, if that's helpful. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, I just realized that that's going to be a big chunk of change to do all that infrastructure and growth while we're also doing the other part. So it also would be a more lengthier timeline, I would think. Yeah, and definitely the tax increment funds aren't going to pay for these things alone. So it'll be you know, um, different sources of funding coming together to, f to fund all this infrastructure. Okay. Dan, did you I, I was just gonna add exactly what Lauren just said is, whether it's the Grand Boulevards, the Green Loop, or the tracks extension, these are significant high ticket items. And so as Kate indicated, we anticipate having a role in that. And oftentimes our role is to do enhancements above and beyond what is sometimes just the, the minimum construction level. 
Um, but we would be a partner in that. We would look to hopefully facilitate those happening sooner than later and see what we can do working with, with the rest of the city and making that happen. So. All righty. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. Anna and uh, Ali, if you have any questions, just please holler because sometimes I forget to look on the screen. Thank you. Moving on to item number three, the resolution of the change in bylaws. And we had Jennifer, Bruno, uh, give us a discussion on this one. Just a brief introduction, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe Councilmember Pooh is online to speak a little bit more to this, but this is um, just an item that um, some board members were interested in. The board um, changed the bylaws uh, a little while ago, and I think based on um, the experience of this last year, would also like to make just one other small adjustment to allow the chair to run for a, um, a second one-year term. So with that, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Pui. Oh, sorry, Board Member Pui. <laughs> board Chair Pui, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Mr. Chair, um, I um, the the original intention, uh, or at least my original intention uh, at the beginning of the year to uh, make the changes uh, from a two-year term uh, as the RDA chair was to add flexibility uh, for those running for leadership within the council and the RDA. Um, but we made the change, so it's basically a one year term and nothing else that is not a possibility for for a chair uh, this one or in the future to have the possibility of running a, a consecutive term um, I will argue that the RDA uh, is uh, there is a learning curve about uh, how the process works and how uh, how all of these projects, come about and many of them take many years to come to fruition. So it is my uh, hope uh, that this board will consider the opportunity for any chair to uh, have the possibility of if you know its colleagues support them uh, to add and run for a second term consecutively. Uh, similarly how it was done before um, before when it was a two year term every time. Thank you, Board Member Bui. Any questions or comments on, on this? Uh, just a couple of clarif clarifying questions. The current bylaws allow a second term, but not consecutive. Is that correct? Or? Yes. Okay. And then the second question is <clears throat> how does this, how, how similar or different from the council's policy is? is what is being proposed. Sorry, how similar is it to the council's policies? Yeah, so if we're saying it's a one-year term, which we changed it to a one-year term, which matched the council mm -hmm. leadership policy, but now we're saying you can run, potentially saying you can run for a second term that is consecutive, but the council's not like- Right, right, so I would just say be for it, is, RDA. it is a little different than the council's right. policy, or it would be. It is. Yeah. And in, in both policies, you can have you have to have a gap of one year between to to sit uh, as chair for either one. Currently, the way it's written. Currently, but this would change the RDAs. Yeah, this would change the RDA to allow you to have two consecutive. Then you need a gap before you can have a third term. A gap of one year. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> Board Mayor Wharton. <laughs> Thank you. How'd you, how'd you know I had something to say? Just had that look on my face. Um, I, I'm fine with this change. Um, I think it might make sense to say that if we're going to say that, unlike the council chair, you can run for this one two consecutive years in a row, I would say that you then need to have a two year hiatus. Um, instead of a one year because then conceivably like someone could if they only served one four-year term on the council they could be rda chair for three of that four years and that seems kind of, kind of a lot to me uh, mr uh, that's a good clarification chris i um and we are just keeping it to be uh hiatus from the rda not not from leadership as a whole is that correct. correct yes correct okay i'm okay with that support with that so just for my clarification, so you, you're okay with changing for two consecutive years and a two-year gap before the third term? Okay. Okay. Correct. Any, any 
comments, questions about that one? Right. And that would only apply to the RDA chair. So like you could still be RDA base chair, you could still be council chair. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, do we need to make an official change to that or? We need so I, I think what you could do and um, Allison could chime in that you could um, adopt this by resolution. So you have a motion to adopt the resolution with the change as articulated by um, board member Wharton. Okay. As Jennifer stated. So moved. Second. I have a motion from board member Mono, a second from board member Pui. On any questions about that motion? And the motion is two consecutive years, a gap of two years, then you can run it again for the RDA chair. All right, no, no questions on that. All in favor say aye. 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 And that motion passes unanimously seven to zero. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number four, and the team setting up here for the ballpark next update. Allison here to give us the update. Director Walls is here. I think Lauren just showed up. And we have Corinne also here from the program management side of RDA. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a briefing about re envisioning the city owned Smith's ballpark and parking lot. It follows the Ballpark Next design competition, which concluded last spring, in which residents, students, professionals were, were invited to submit their ideas for the future of the ballpark site. This um, this briefing includes an RDA staff request to use existing State Street project area funds for, I'm sorry, let me get that title right, State Street project area strategic intervention funds to supplement the, or sorry, to support the search for a design consultant team for overall park design and implementation. I'll stop talking now so someone who can talk can begin. Great, thank you so much, Allison. Um, as Allison mentioned we'll be giving you an update on our progress with our uh, community visioning process that's taking place now um, and then we'll jump into our anticipated next steps for the design consultant and that potential uh, straw poll um, to indicate support to return to the budget amendment to utilize those State Street project area funds. Next, oh, should we have a um, presentation if we could pull that up as well, please. That's just the memo. <laughs> there should be a presentation as well. It's all that we were emailed for this item. If there's something else, uh, you can uh, you can send it to scott.corpany at slc.gov and I can get it on the screen immediately. Oh boy. Okay, we'll do that. Sorry, who did you say to send it to? It's Scott period Corpany, C-O-R-P-A-N-Y at slcgov.com. Okay, thank you. One second. All right, it's sent. That I'm just loading it up right now. It'll be just a moment. Thank you, Scott. Right, yeah. Great, thank you so much, Scott. And we can start on that next slide. Oh, it has my notes in it. <laughs> I sent you the wrong one. That's okay, we're just gonna go with it. Um, okay, so uh, as Elsa mentioned, we last checked in with you at our design competition, um, which is a creative way to begin collecting ideas. We had over 123 applications and concluded with a celebration event, which many of you attended. Thank you for that. 
Uh, our staff collected all the themes that we heard and we used those to move into our next step, which is our community visioning process that we're doing right now in partnership with GSBS Architects. We kicked that off in August. This builds on our previous engagement efforts and it's a really big, extensive community engagement process to create what we're calling the Ballpark Next Guiding Principles. And essentially, uh, these are going to encompass the community's vision for what should happen at the site and they'll, we'll use those to inform our next steps of development. We're also uh, working with GSBS to do some additional research, such as best practices on um, you know, cities in similar positions that have lost a, a team and have a vacancy um, so that we learn um, from other examples. And then we're also working on adaptive reuse opportunities and evaluating the structure. Uh, we anticipate that the guiding principles will be done uh, in February 2024, and we have uh, a draft that we're working on right now with the community, and we'll keep working through that till the finish. And on the visual on the right, you can see basically how we're filtering down to our next steps. So we have the design competition, we're in the middle of the community visioning process, the result will be the guiding principles, and this will then inform our next step, which is our proposed design consultant team um, that we'll talk about in the next couple slides. Next slide, please. Um, one of the main considerations for our next step it, of soliciting a design consultant is the many stakeholders and opportunities that this project has that we really want to incorporate and get right. So if you look at the visual on the right, it's essentially our stakeholder wheel. Um, and we have our neighborhood priorities, which we just mentioned. Those are being determined in the ballpark guiding principles. We also have our agency and city priorities. We have our ballpark station area plan goals and how this project connects with the larger neighborhood. We also have area stakeholder opportunities. These are largely properties like the UTA property or other ones that may be something we can connect to strategically. And we also have our parcel considerations such as the structure itself um, and different considerations for the site. And then finally, the legacy fund opportunity, which um, many of you are familiar with. This is a $100 million impact investment opportunity for the neighborhood and this fund is focusing on proving community well-being and health outcomes and is collecting a lot of data at this time uh, to help inform what those outcomes could be. So if you look at the larger pink circle, that's essentially how we see our design consultant team helping us navigate and really interweave all of these stakeholders and all of these considerations um, for a, a really establishing a collective vision of success that will inform an urban design framework. And then we see that framework really informing our development RFP and what actually takes place on the site when we choose a development team. And Lauren will dive into that in our next slide. Thanks, Corinne. Yeah. So RDA staff is aiming to release the request for proposals to solicit the design consultant team by the end of this month. Um, the goal of this process will be to incorporate the community's guiding principles that Corinne talked about um, and human-centered design into a final design framework and programming recommendations for the ball ballpark site. Um, human-centered design, as it applies to real estate development, involves deeply understanding the needs of a community and testing ideas to create places that prioritize the end user in a meaningful way. So for example, how do the people of the ballpark neighborhood get from one place to another? And how might the ballpark development enhance this experience to be safer, more sustainable, and interactive? So we'd really like our consultants to take this um, human-centered design approach. The final deliverable, or the design framework, will be, will be based on a shared vision of success and consists of components such as the recommended location of building footprints, building massing and scale, proposed right-of-way locations, suggested land uses, including pu public and private uses, and programming ideas. We hope to get the design consultant that's going to create this framework selected um, by March, and, and we'll start this process, process in March. Um, and once the design framework is completed, the RDA will solicit a development partner to implement the design framework and construct the project. So today we're asking the board to consider taking a straw poll to indicate um, your support for utilizing State Street project area funds for this RFP contingent um, upon staff returning with, con will return once the design collect design consultant is selected with a specific budget request. And that's all we have. So you're looking for 
straw poll on using State Street funds to go through the process for the uh, design consultant? Yes, to put out the RFP. Mm -hmm. Put out the RFP. In, um, in the fiscal year 2024 budget, we did um, have funding set aside from State Street for um, consultant work for Ballpark Next. We've utilized um, some of that for this community visioning process. We have about 150,000 left, but we anticipate for the, the size of the scope we're asking for that we'll need additional funds. Okay, right. So we allocated 300,000, we've got $150,000 left. Is that what we have? And you want additional? Okay. Can I ask first a little more clarification on what the scope of the development or the design consultant would be doing they just they're helping us draft the rfp no so um we're we've drafted the rfp and we already we have a high level scope of work that we'd be asking for and essentially we'd be looking at them to help us coordinate all of those large stakeholders create that vision of success and then go through really a lot of um, testing and iterative process to come up with concepts that can happen at the ballpark site so that we have all of that work done ourselves prior to selecting the developer partner and we're essentially issuing our developer RFP um, already with an idea of what all of our stakeholders um, want to see built there. And I would just add that the final p deliverable is what we're calling a design framework that'll consist of kind of a site plan with building massing and scale, building footprints, right-of-way alignment, so kind of a high-level overview of what this development will be, and then we'll go and select a development partner to do the construction. That's unique, right? It's different than how we normally do it, yeah. Yeah, and I think the main reason, um, the slide that we showed with all of those moving pieces, we're taking this approach and not skipping straight to development RFP so that our stakeholders have a little bit more involvement in deciding what happens and, and, and also we can incorporate our impact investment fund opportunity. So there's a lot of unique things we haven't maneuvered before and so we see this as an opportunity to really make sure that that vision of success is complete and incorporates all these pieces so we don't have stakeholders making decisions in different areas on what the final outcome should be. And realistically, the outcome of this, it's multiple parcels and they're large parcels, so realistically the outcome is going to be several buildings. I, I, I assume, my, that would be my guess, is that it's not going to be, well, it can't be one big building. It could be two big buildings, I guess, but I assume it's gonna be more than that. Um, those are going to be, you're saying that we're going to have rough footprints and massings and programming, not necessarily the buildings designed yet? Right, correct. Um, is there a possibility then that when the development RFP goes out that those are all individual, um, like that it's not one developer doing all of the buildings, but it could be multiple parties doing different things? at different, different pieces yeah. of it? Perhaps, I don't think we know quite yet, but if, if you're saying that that's something that you'd like to see as far as different um, opportunities, we could explore I, that when we get. I'd like to see that. I'd also like to see the, in the instruction to the, the design consultant or the work with the design consultant that there's a, a request to consider mixed scales of buildings. Mm -hmm. So rather than just three really large buildings, maybe there's a couple large buildings and some really small buildings as well. I think that's one of the things that we've, that I feel like is missing from a lot of our redeveloping neighborhoods is that we end up with a lot of buildings that are all the same size, mm -hmm. five over two, you know, the same building that we see over and over. And I'd like to consider in this area how we can have large buildings, but also have some small buildings and how both of those are adding to the neighborhood in different ways. Definitely, and I think um, what we're seeing um, in our first draft of the guiding principles from the community lines up with that largely, and they would like to incorporate you know, green space and different scales, and so I think that that would be something that manifested in a lot of the consultant work and the concepts that come through. Right, and I, I mean, this is probably sounding a lot like some of my comments during the fleet block discussions, but having what opportunities for different uh, groups and organizations to not just be housed there in the future, but actually own part of the real estate. So it's not just like one developer that owns the whole 13 acres and then they get to lease to different places, but 
if we're talking about having nonprofits housed there, that they actually have opportunity to be, be the development partner or be part of the team that, that controls the land as well. Okay, great, thank I, you. I would like to see those sorts of things incorporated into the, to the RFP. Oops. Thank you, Boomer Pizzo. Well, with this kind of inverting of process and kind of doing it peculiarly, are we determined that we're selling the land or is there a possibility we would retain ownership and be a development partner or land leasing? Are all of those on the table or do you have an idea which way you want to go with it? I think at this time they're all on the table. Okay. I would be in favor of us retaining ownership and being part of a venture, a, a joint venture that would allow us to have say in what happens, but also potentially receive cash flow from it that we could reinvest in local priorities. Uh, I guess the question I, um, have we seen this model, like I'd be interested in seeing where this model has worked, maybe in other cities, I don't think that we've done it before. And is the appetite from the development community strong enough where, I th what I like about this, is that it's theoretically putting us in more of a controlling position than most of our RFPs are, and they're thereby the community more in a controlling position. Developers may see that as the opposite and have less interest in it. I, I hope that's not the case, and I hope we still have a lot of interest in get really good development partners to build the buildings that we are saying we want to have in this neighborhood. Um, and I like the direction. I'm intrigued by it. I just would... It would be interesting to me to, to find out about other projects around the country where that, that type of model has been successful. Definitely, we can provide those. And um, some of the due diligence we did to craft this next step was we interviewed um, consultants nationwide that had experience with a similar process. And really, as Lauren mentioned, focusing on that human-centered design with the end user in mind. Um, so that's where we started. And a lot of their feedback helped us shape how this process could work and be successful. I would also add that I this is kind of the approach we're taking with the station center site in terms of working with a consultant, coming up with that vision plan, and then moving uh, forward with implementation and construction. And you'll hear more about that next, maybe? <laughs> Today, at some point. All right, thank you very much. Any other questions? All right, seeing no other questions. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Did you want to? Oh, no, we did a straw poll. Exactly. And Danny's going like thumbs up. I totally, <laughs> totally forgot about the straw poll we were just asking about. So uh, I, mo I will look for a straw poll. Do you want to propose a straw poll? I'm, In, uh, uh, we're, I, we're looking to use State Street funding to uh, search for the design consultant team. So that's my straw poll. Yeah, that could I be. I want us to use State Street funding for this next study phase. Any, all in favor of the uh, straw poll on the hand? Any questions? All right. Give me a thumbs up if you're... And I have uh, six to zero with council... Oh, seven to zero right now. There it is. Okay. That passes you. Thank you. That straw poll Thank uh, you. is unanimous. <laughs> Moving on to item number five, a resolution alone to the Rocky Ventures for the Front Climbing Club. All right. We have Kara up here, and then we have Austin coming up here. Kara, the RDA Deputy Chair, and Austin, the Project Manager. It's all yours, Austin. Okay, thank you. So, can we get a presentation, please? Thanks. <clears throat> So board members, today we're asking you to consider a loan application that we've received for the Front Climbing Club. Um, I'll talk about this soon, but the Front Climbing Club is located in our State Street project area. It's a local business that's been around for um, at least a couple decades, and it's looking to expand its presence in the State Street project area. So. I'll talk about the expansion project, but they're asking for a loan of $2 million with a three-year term and an interest rate that right now is about 5.5%. It'll change depending on the, um, the treasury yields. But let's go to the next slide, please. So this is the current um, front climbing gym. This is one of their newer buildings in that area. 
that was built in the late 2010s. It houses climbing walls, fitness center. Go to the next slide. As you look inside of it, you can see a large climbing wall up to 70 feet tall. The front climbing gyms have thousands of members. Um, it draws people from around the Salt Lake area into the State Street Project area and activates the ballpark neighborhood. Let's go to the next slide. Not only does the front have climbing, but they also have different fitness classes, uh, such as cycling you see here, weightlifting, yoga. Let's go to the next slide. Apart from fitness, the front also acts as a community center. It hosts all sorts of events open to the public and attracts um, activity, positive activity into its area. Let's go to the next slide. So as I said before, the front is located in the RDA State Street Project area in the ballpark neighborhood. The front owns 3.85 acres along 400 West. And as, as you look at the screen here, the yellow outlined area is all of the land that the front owns. The green area is what will be incorporated into its expansion project, which is what the front's asking us to loan on. Let's go to the next slide. And here's an aerial view of the front Salt Lake climbing complex. On the far left slide is that, or the far left side is that new building that I told you about. In the middle with the green um, highlighted roof is its original building. And then on, on the right side next to it is a new building that the front has acquired. The expansion project is going to connect all three buildings into one large climbing gym complex. And it'll be renovating those two buildings that are highlighted in green. Let's go to the next slide. These are just some views of the front um, buildings that will be expanded into from the street view. Let's go to the next slide, please. And this is that second building that the front recently acquired and will be building into. Next slide. Here's a site plan for the front's expansion project. Um, this will be completed in four phases and the front is asking um, for this loan to help fund three of the phases. So as you can see, phases one through three expand into two of those buildings that I showed you, um, adaptively reusing these um, concrete block buildings, adding things like fitness studios, bathrooms and showers, additional climbing walls, and then replacing mechanical and electrical equipment as well as adding large windows with great views for the customers. Next slide. So the reason why the front is coming to the RDA to ask for a loan is because it has applied for a loan through its traditional financing sources and, and been denied several times. And this is not because um, it's a challenging business, it's just uncertainty in the market right now. Um, you know, banks are tightening their credit. They're not looking to lend as much, especially on opportunistic investments like climbing gyms. There are only so many climbing gyms in Utah. Um, to a bank, it's an unknown business model. And so they're a little bit skittish to lend on a climbing gym. Um, if he, if he, there, there are a few banks that have been interested. What they would want to do is refinance the entire front complex, which would mean refinancing all of those buildings that I showed you, changing the interest rates dramatically, and increasing the payments that the front would have to do. Whereas the RDA could lend just on one project, and um, it wouldn't mess with the interest rates on the other buildings. And then lastly, we believe this project does align with the State Street Project Area Plan. Let's go to the next slide. So for a project, for a commercial project to qualify for an RDA loan, uh, specifically for senior financing like is being asked here, typically it needs to meet six of our public benefit criteria. So I have listed here seven of the criteria that um, it either meets or comes close to meeting. We believe 
uh, if you looked at it from a strict point of view, it meets five of the public benefit criteria and comes close to two others. So let, let me describe those to you. The first is the public amenities criteria. RDA policy requires that one and a half percent of the loan value be spent on public art, and the project will meet that criteria. The adaptive reuse criteria requires the repurposing of existing buildings, which will be met through this project. Our permanent job creation criteria requires the creation of new jobs. Um, typically, there's a, there's a set amount of money. I think it's $50,000 per job that we'll land up to. And so um, 40 new jobs would allow this project to lend. We, we, we could lend $2 million on that. Um, this also meets the transit alternatives public benefit criteria because it includes showers, lockers, and indoor bike parking, as well as a car sharing parking stall. This also meets our economic impact public benefit criteria by dedicating 100% of the space to locally owned businesses. <clears throat> These next two criteria aren't met 100%. Um, they come close, but, but they're not fully met. So in sustainability, Typically, we would require a project to have an Energy Star score of 90 or higher to meet our sustainable development policy. It's a rating system that uses an index um, of data from other like buildings. And because there are not too many climbing gyms out there that are submitting the energy use to the EPA, you actually can't get an Energy Star score for a climbing gym. Um, apart from that, there's no ranking system that shows where this building would stand compared to other um, other climbing gyms through the energy use intensity score so, so so we can't even calculate that score for this building so it doesn't it doesn't meet that but I would say from the sustainability perspective it does operate on a net zero electric basis by sourcing all of its energy from renewable sources that's from both rooftop solar and off-site renewables through Rocky Mountain Power's Blue Sky program. It's been awarded a Utah Business and Rocky Mountain Power Blue Sky Green Small Business Legacy Award for that. And then also, this expansion project models a 24% decrease in electricity use consumption and 21% decrease in overall utility costs compared to a baseline code building. The second public benefit that it doesn't meet but comes close to is the architecture and urban design criteria. Um, this project does incorporate a lot of the design that we look to include, such as large windows, masonry walls, landscape buffers, and converting parking spaces into an outdoor plaza. But because the project is already designed and already under construction, we can't do a review and we can't suggest revisions on it. And so it doesn't meet that criteria. So to, to sum it up, typically we would require six of these. It meets five, and it comes close to two of those. Let's go to the next slide. Could I ask a couple questions on the two that it doesn't quite meet? So you're saying the sustainability one is because it actually can't receive a rating, and our ordinance says that it needs to have an energy star rating. So that seems like a... I think that we should, I mean, we should certainly make an exception, but I think we should probably look at adjusting our ordinance to a, these are the ways that you can meet our sustainability ordinance for projects that are not, that the Energy Star isn't, and I don't know that the Energy Star program really is the gold standard or not, right? So, but anyway, um, and then the other one you're saying, it might meet our design criteria, but because we can't, because it's already designed, then our design criteria requires that we have, have a design review design? process, like the we is already a staff do. But if it's a good design that just came, even though we weren't involved in the process, there should still be credit for. I I think that, in the right. Cri yeah, um, but in the description of the criteria for that public benefit, for meeting that public benefit, it requires um, an opportunity for the RDA to have meaningful input into the design. So yeah. um, we felt like we couldn't, um, we couldn't 
claim that it meets that public benefit without having that opportunity. I, mean, I think both of those bring up things that maybe we need to take a look at, take a look at in our ordinance because it, the, and RDA staff is great, and I think our, that pro design pro review process is helpful in a lot of ways, but it's certainly not the only way to a, to a design that's above and beyond what we're typically getting uh, for most projects. So I, I think both of those, I guess what I'm saying is I, I think in this case, it sounds like you know we're moving towards considering, even though they don't meet the exact code to make an exception, I think we should do make that exception, and we should also look at the... Yeah. the actual ordinance and policy to see if that just needs to be codified. Yeah, I'd agree. And I, and I think it's, thanks for that uh, presentation here, Austin, and, and kind of explaining those two, because I think the RDA would say, yes, this does meet our design criteria, but we can't, since we weren't able to give you meaningful inputs, uh, which is kind of like egotistical, like, oh, we, we should give you inputs because we know better than a lot of people, so it's nice. We, it's still a good product. And their design is still good. And I, I, their energy efficiency numbers, I think if those are true, the 24% to 21% uh, and not uh, forecasted, then that's nice. Yeah, and I can clarify on the sustainable development policy here on this slide that we have up. So there are two ways to meet that policy. One is if you hit the design to earn the energy star score of 90 or greater which again a climbing gym is unable to apply for that program because there are so few climbing gyms in there the second is if you hit an eui score energy use intensity score corresponding to that energy star score of 90 um, and again because there are, there's not an index out there publicly available because there are so few climbing gyms it, it can't do that the second one that i forgot to mention on the last slide is we generally require all electric building operations. This project um, will not do all electric building operations. It, it has gas heating installed at, right now, um, and it is reinstalling gas heating, upgrading it, and, and that's because of the ceiling heights. In a climbing gym like this, you've got up to 70-foot ceiling heights. Um, what the applicant said is that there right now is no efficient electric powered system that can heat an airspace like that was 70 feet tall i can see that um, and the applicants here if you have any questions about that and i i think one thing we wanted to add to that is um in this project specifically which is adaptive reuse and it's already an existing climbing gym converting the um heating system over to electric is especially um infeasible um, and and it might be something that we could consider with a new construction project but this specific project with the high ceilings and the existing buildings and the adaptive reuse make it difficult Why, any other questions I just have one question for the maybe the uh, the applicant and it's just about uh, the the f using those large fans you, you see in uh, large manufacturing areas you know uh, low volume or low speed high volume fans they call them used to call them big ass fans it's one of the yeah, manufacturers yes, we, we have those oh, you have those yes oh perfect those are those are great those are very energy efficient fans for large volumes of air going down and keeping the uh, area cool or or warm and circulating the air so i'm glad you're using them that's great so give me a double thumbs up for me thank you thanks if you don't have any other questions on the sustainability, we can get to the financial parts of the yeah. of the loan. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so here's the sources and uses for the phase one through three of the expansion project. The estimated cost is five million dollars. The owner is contributing three million in um, equity cash flow from the business and asking us to contribute two million dollars to a loan. And let's go to the next slide. Here are the draft loan terms. With the interest rate reductions that the project qualifies for, at the time we sent this presentation in um, to, to, the, to the mayor's office uh, and to you all, the final interest rate was looking 5.3%. You know, that, that's probably fluctuated with today's interest rates, but that's about what it qualified for at that time. The term is proposed to be three years with an amortization period of 20 years. 
And let's go to the next slide. So that's a balloon payment at year three then? What's that? That means it's a balloon payment at year three? Yep. And here's the collateral that would be backing the loan. It would be a lien on both of the buildings that are being um, repurposed and a personal guarantee. If you look at the appraised value of both of those buildings, as is, they stand at about $8.4 million. So um, currently they sit at a loan to value without our loan of 43%. As this project is complete, an as-built appraisal shows it valued at $11.3 million. With our $2 million into that, the loan to value would stand at 50%. So staff feels like this is a safe loan um, to lend on with this collateral. And that's my presentation. We're happy to take any questions you all have. Thank you, Austin. Appreciate that. Uh, any other questions for Austin's? Um, Austin's? Austin? If construction financing is hard to get on the just general market for this project. Um, I, I know construction financing and permanent financing are different, but in the event that permanent financing is hard to get at year three, is there a provision of the loan to extend the term? Um, keeping the, if it, what happens if they can't make the balloon payment in three years? Um, I think we would probably reconsider the interest rate and and consider a term extension, but I think... And those would be board decisions at that, for whatever board is in place at the time? Is that how that works? Sorry, what was... Uh, if that is necessary, would that be like when we come and get loan modification? We've seen loan modifications before. It would be that same process? Exactly. Okay. So there is a process, though. That makes sense. All right. Thank you very much. And we're looking for a motion to approve this. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the loan as presented by RDA staff. Second. second. I have a motion from Council Member, from Board Member Mono, a second from Board Member Vado Morris. Any questions on this item? All in favor say aye. 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 And that motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number six, informational, the station center funding strategy. Kara's still here. We have Ashley Ogden, from another senior project manager, and Marcus Lee, the project coordinator. And Danny. <laughs> Right, and we also had a slide deck for this item. There we go, thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I wanna acknowledge uh, the Station Center team because we're not all up here, but I work with Kara Lindsley and Marcus Lee as a project coordinator who works very hard on this project with me. Um, we're here to discuss the Station Center project, uh, specifically a funding strategy for the public improvements that will need to be made to carry out the development plan. Next slide, please. So, you can see it here. Um, so uh, the station center site includes about 11 acres of RDA owned property located between UT Intermodal Hub, Rio Grande Depot, 200 South and 400 South. Um, you may recall in September, the consultants presented a uh, progress update for what we call the Station Center Vision and Implementation Plan. So they took your feedback and they're currently putting the final touches on the plan and it will be complete at the end of this month. Um, it's looking great and we're very excited to share it when it's finished, but um, in the meantime, here's a sneak peek at a very lovely rendering um, from the plan. Next slide, please. So we'll start with a very quick reminder of our vision for the district. Um, our vision statement reads, the neon glow of the Rio Grande sign shining, sign shining atop the historic depot is a beacon, welcoming all Utahns to be a part of a robust new downtown neighborhood located at Utah's most transit-rich gateway. Next slide, please. So this slide covers uh, the key goals for the development programming and positioning of Station Center. Our key development goal is to establish the neighborhood as the standard for transit-oriented development in Salt Lake City and the state of Utah. 
Our key programming goal is to create a new urban scale development that leverages local organizations uh, to create a program and activate a district for art, community health and wellness, and organic economic growth for Salt Lake City. And our key positioning goal is to foster a walkable community that takes advantage of density to create a mixed use, mixed income, and inclusive district. Next slide, please. So as master developer, the RDA will play a pivotal role in the development operations and long-term success of Station Center. Uh, this project's unique because it's a rare opportunity to be in the driver's seat to plan and curate a significant amount of downtown land into a living, breathing neighborhood that is intentionally programmed and activated for 18 hours a day. So this slide shows, uh, describes the many hats the RDA will need to wear to achieve this vision. Um, we're the primary landowner, we will facilitate the development of RDA-owned properties. Um, as the infrastructure developer, we'll design, construct, manage, and ma maintain public improvements, of course, in partnership with the city. And as the programming manager, we'll lead the activation of Station Center in collaboration with adjacent property owners, tenants, and local organizations. And finally, as district curator, we have an opportunity to use RDA tools to incentivize other parties, including developers and space users, to advance our vision and policy goals. Next slide, please. So the rest of the presentation and conversation will be focused on infrastructure development and a potential funding strategy improvements shown in the Station Center plan. Um, yeah, this, this is their correct slide. Um, so here, the map on the left shows property ownership within the study area. Um, the RDA owns everything in purple. Artspace owns uh, the pieces on the north block in pink. The University of Utah owns a piece of the southwest corner shown in green, and the orange parcels are privately owned. Um, and the right image is an aerial photo of existing site conditions. Next slide, please. So this is a, a comprehensive list of the public improvements contained in the State Center plan, and we'll go into more detail in future slides. Uh, but the proposed work includes utility upgrades to provide for increased density, the narrowing and reconstruction of 300 South into a pedestrian first street that can be closed and utilized for public events, construction of new mid-block streets to break up the large blocks for a more walkable environment, construction of public spaces that can accommodate events, and supporting the TOD vision with a shared parking structure that can be used by multiple tenants and visitors during their respective peak hours. Next slide. So I'll quickly break down each of those items. Um, this map shows the existing utilities in the neighborhood. Upgrading utilities in Station Center will require replacing some existing pipes to provide additional capacity, as well as installing new utilities along mid-block streets to accommodate adjacent development. Water, sewer, st stormwater, and electrical upgrades will be included in the project. And our priorities for these upgrades are to promote water conservation, sustainable solutions for managing stormwater, and the harnessing of solar energy. Next. And this drawing shows the proposed street improvements, which involves breaking up the large blocks with new mid-block streets to create a more walkable urban environment and more compact development parcels. The city vacated the edges of 300 South uh, back in 2014 to narrow the right-of-way, and our plan calls for the reconstruction of 300 South into a shared street where cars are allowed, but pedestrians and gathering spaces are prioritized. 300 South will be designed with the option to uh, close for events, and we've already seen their strong interest from neighborhood organizations to activate and program this space. And this is more than just a street, a street construction project. Um, we're aiming to create complete streets with wide sidewalks, tree canopy, lighting, and furnishings to support community spaces that are welcoming and comfortable for everyone. Next. Um, so public spaces. Uh, the plan also includes spaces for public gathering, including an art alleyway slash plaza that will visually connect art spaces' historic macaroni flats building to the north with the RDA Salt Lake Mattress Company uh, warehouse to the south. The alley itself will host art installations and provide flex space for events that our community loves but has struggled to find permanent homes for in recent years. Adjacent development will support art alley programming with ground floor maker and incubator spaces for micro, art, micro enterprises, artists, and artisans. And the plan also calls for a plaza at the southwest corner of 500 West and 300 South, adjacent to the plan Green Loop and Rio Grande Depot. 
And um, speaking of the Green Loop, the consultants developed a conceptual design um, for this section of Green Loop that will run through Station Center, which we're planning to collaborate with the city um, on to fund and implement. But for that reason, the Fifth West Green Loop, this section is not included in our funding strategy. To Next. And last but definitely not least is the recommendation for the RDA to develop a shared parking structure near the intersection 500 West and 400 South. Um, our goal is to capitalize on the area's unmatched transit access to create a model of transit-oriented development where land is put to more productive uses than parking. Um, as such, our plan calls for very progressive parking ratios that the Salt Lake City market is not yet providing. Um, this will rely on aggressive parking and transportation demand management strategies to be successful, including unbundled and shared parking agreements. And we've recognized this is something that the RDA will need to be very intentional about, and we're proposing to lead out with a shared structure that can be leased to nearby developments with the goal of eliminating individual parking being provided for each development. And we chose this location for the structure because we want to concentrate parking at the perimeter of the site and reduce vehicle traffic um, internal to the site. And also, uh, the reduction in the number of parking facilities throughout the site will mean less curb cuts and less risk of vehicle pedestrian conflict. Next. May I ask a question yeah. Question on that? Is that, um, is the shared parking strategy to encourage less on-site parking within individual developments or would we actually restrict it? Um, I think restricting could be an option, especially on RDA owned parcels that we put out for RFP, through RFP. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah our plan, all of the parking and our off-street parking in our plan is in this garage that we're talking about today. Um, and then there's two residential developments that have structured parking with the residential components. And, and, and that's all of the It's anticipated that the ground level of the garage could be used for non-parking, like Regent Street parking garages. That's definitely an option. We haven't gotten that, that far yet. Okay. But yeah. So um, this slide shows the anticipated tasks and cost estimates for the development of the utility streets, public spaces, and parking structure. Um, and I wanted to note that RDA staff created these cost estimates based on previous design work and um, increased construction costs, but we'll be able to refine um, them further and get more exact as we move through design. We're estimating it will cost approximately $2.5 million to design and $25 million to construct the utility street public spaces. We're estimating it could cost about $33 million to design and construct the shared parking structure. And the right column lists some proposed funding sources that could be used for the improvements, um, but we're here today to get your feedback and suggestions to incorporate into our next steps. Um, you know, first we're proposing to use existing depot district infrastructure funds to design everything but the parking structure. And this would allow us to move into design as soon as uh, our vision and implementation plan is completed this month. Um, the bigger ticket items, construction of the improvements in design and construction of the parking structure will require additional funding. Um, our, our staff's currently preparing an application to create an HTRZ that's centered on the intermodal hub, um, which this project would benefit from. And if that's approved, we could potentially use some of that increment to pay back a bond or loan from the state infrastructure bank. Um, the station center plans always involved the RDA building out these public improvements, but in the past, our funding strategy relied on using land sale proceeds. In, in recent years, um, ground leasing our land has been a priority of the administration and board. And ground leasing the station center properties um, is a great idea and will allow the city to retain ownership of these important assets, but it does eliminate that infusion of funds we would receive up front if we were to sell the land. Next. Um, so this slide includes, Actually, oh yeah, sorry. Sorry, I just had one question on the previous slide. Yeah. So when I'm looking at it, is that in order of priority? So my real, like, the question I'm trying to get at is, is the construction of the utilities and streets ahead of the parking structure, or are we looking to do those simultaneously? We're looking to do those simultaneously, but um, because we anticipate the south block will be our first phase of development, so we would like that structure to be in progress or in place um, when we're negotiating with developers of adjacent property, because we would ideally like them to lease spaces in that garage from us. 
Um, I would say utilities and streets are slightly higher priority than that garage structure. Okay, I, I would concur with that just in terms of making sure that the entire space is being developed to move forward. The reason I note that is I see under the potential funding sources, both of those share a lot of same streams. And so if we're only able to access a certain amount of funding through those, it would make sense to me as a board member to prioritize the streets first. Yes. Um, okay, yeah, and I think we are going to go to the next slide, um, which shows a uh, proposed development timeline over the next few years if there is support um, for the RDA to pursue financing for these public improvements. Um, and I won't read every milestone, but our primary goal is to be able to construct the improvements while the first site is under development, and we project a groundbreaking for the first site in fall of 2024. Um, so it is an aggressive timeline, but um, if we want to use our vision to attract strong development partners, we'll need to keep momentum going with the infrastructure build out. Um, and if we have your support, we would ideally start final design work in uh, early 2024. That's all I have. All right, thank you, Ashley. Any questions? Board Member Mono? Uh, yeah, and it makes me sad to even bring this up or 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 conceptualize that this might be possible but i'm worried or i'm i think it would be smart for us to look at having a few different options as we go through the design of the utilities and the parking structure um that would anticipate if we can do, get everything we want this is what we want but is there a plan b that maybe doesn't require as much funding maybe it's not quite as amazing as the images that we were shown or the things that we've always all wanted, but could potentially still make the goals that we need happen. And then maybe it's 15 years from now that we actually go in and do the upgraded art walk or whatever. I, I, I don't know, art walk isn't, that isn't, that's not to say the art walk's the lowest priority or the first thing to get, get cut, but like there's a lot of things in this plan that I want to have happen and I hope that they're possible and I hope that we get all of them. But I think it would be smart for us. But what I definitely don't want is nothing to happen. And if we can't get, if we can't afford the Cadillac, but like the Civic is still going to get us to from point A to point B, then I I would rather buy something on the get something developed on the lot than nothing. So I don't want us to only have the biggest, brightest vision. Ever, and if that's not possible, then it stalls for another decade or something like that. So I'd rather see something than nothing. I'd rather see all of the things happen for, the, for that area, but I'd rather see something than nothing. So I think it'd be smart for us to plan that as we're doing the design, plan it so that we don't have to like completely start over the process, have that plan B in, in, case, in case the funding doesn't come through. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Board Member Bottom Wallace. So I, the comment to that, to their ends, uh, and, and when we get this done, this area has been stalled for as long as I can remember. Um, and we have a huge opportunity with the Olympics coming back to kind of really focus on this area and have that extra or that whole new neighborhood for the visitors, the tourists, and the residents here. And as residents showing the world, you know, the cool things that we do in terms of art or other things that we're planning to have there. So um, I, you know, I, I would like to, you know, for this project to, to really um, look at it as a priority um, and try to find the funding um, from different resources if possible, and also work hand in hand with the state and the Grand Boulevards if there's a, if there's a, a, you know, an opportunity there to do the construction at the same time, um, or whatever it is that it's going to happen on Four South in terms of train um, tracks, I mean, or, or anything else that that we are really connected with the other stakeholders and do some of this work simultaneously simultaneously to to gain you know to to gain some time and to have something cool you know ready for the olympics i mean that's a i would 
that would be a really cool goal for me and as a board member to say, well, by this time, you know, these are the things that we want to do and and we'll have we're gonna have a really good product. Um, you know, in 10 years or hopefully less than that. Anyway, those are my two cents for this project. Thanks. Thank you, board member Horton. Do you have a comment? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm also really excited to move forward on this, and I think I mostly share um, Councilmember Mano's feedback. I would love to start seeing some kind of development there because I think that gets people talking and asking questions. And um, and along those lines, and I this is nitpicky, and I almost hate to bring it up because you said the documents, the visioning documents are almost done. Um, I found that when I've talked to a couple people about this, including developers and residents, that no one knows what Station Center is. Um, and they're like, I thought it was called Center Station. And I was like, well, that's a different RDA project, actually. And they're like, oh, you mean the city hub? And I'm like, no, that's the transit stop at the end of, or on 21st or whatever that one's called, or the city exchange. Um, is there a way to maybe like control F and do a, Rio Grande Station Center in there somewhere, just so that we, that when we do have these visioning documents and stuff going out, especially as we make this more public facing, that people know what we're talking about and and we can capture the excitement as opposed to the first question not being what is that and where is it. I agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. We we've discussed this a lot. We actually did a, a little uh, exercise with AI just for fun to see what kind of names it's. Spit out, spit out at us, but oh, um, man. I would love to see those results. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's uh, that's definitely on our radar and, and something that we know we probably need to do. Thanks, thanks for bringing that back up because that is you absolutely still true. Yeah, yeah, just helps. <laughs> um, I'm eager to see something happen here too. I think you know, it's every time I drive by on my way to the gym. Just think how much promise this area has. Um, I'm still, I'm a little concerned about how much progress we're going to make before we go more in depth about that governance structure we were talking about and what a decision making structure in the future will look like. I don't want to go merrily down a row if there are still details that we need to hash out and, um, you know, have difficult conversations. I love productive conflict when it brings about best answers best outcomes, but I'd like to have that before we're too far, too deeply entrenched and our hands are tied by circumstances instead of by what would be best for this area. If I could just say something to that, um, we can definitely come back and, or yeah, meet with you and, and, and talk about the governance recommend, recommendations because that is a piece of this. Um, but I did want to, to let you know, um, you know, based on feedback we've received in the past and at the September board meeting, we did ask the consultant team to focus on governance recommendations that could be implemented within the existing RDA structure, um, which, you know, we, that may require some additional resources in the future as we, as the plan comes to life, you know, namely staffing. Um, but, you know, we can continue to assess that as things progress. We'd be happy to meet or, or come back with an item on that. All right. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ashley. Moving on to item number seven, report announcements from the executive director. Executive director has no comments. Oh, your time's up. Just Go ahead. love having a microphone here. I, too, do not like the name Station Center. I just want to say that on the record. I've never liked it. Let's change the name. <laughs> and break the microphone. <laughs> All right. Item number eight, report and announcements from the RDA staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I don't know how you do a mic drop on these mics, but I think <laughs> you nailed it. Um, one announcement, Mr. Chair. Uh, we just wanted to uh, stay for the board's notification on November 17th. We did release this year's notice of funding availability. These are the funds that you as a board uh, allocated and approved to support the development and preservation of affordable housing. That $13.7 million breaks out to be $4.2 million of RDA funds and then $9.5 million of the HUD funds that you approved as part of the annual budget. 
to go through the NOFA. Um, you'll recall that for rental developments, this requires a minimum of 20% of the units to be affordable at 60% AMI. In addition, you as a board approved the funding conditions that either or, uh, either 10% of the units have to be family sized affordable units, so that'd be three plus bedrooms at the 60% AMI, or 10% uh, of the units have to be deeply affordable at 40% AMI or below. So that NOFA is out on the street right now. The deadline for submissions is January 3rd. We will then review them as staff, uh, and we look to probably bring that to you in a board uh, approval motion, most likely in March. Uh, not sure we could turn it around fast enough for February, but that'll be coming to you in March. Thank you very much again for your support on that. Okay, Mr. Chair. Remember, can you tell me again how much the NOFA is this year? I'm sorry. What's the top, the overall number for the NOFA this year again? 13.7. 13.7. And is that inclusive of the unused high opportunity funds as well? That's all part of the, oh, the high opportunity, yes. Okay, so that's, that's part of the 13.7. Mm -hmm. Okay. No? No. Oh being told by okay. no separate so um with that i think it's like 2.7 that's left or something i of the of the high opportunity can i guess my question is at what point i know we just updated the mm -hmm. priorities is that just on a rolling whoever comes in first um but if in the nofa there's some that actually are in the high opportunity would it be, is it flexible enough for us to use those first and then? We award? can take that direction. If something comes in, we could bring that to you as a recommendation as part of our evaluation of the applications. And I think, I guess where I'm going with that is that we updated the policy about it, or we talked about that last meeting or re recently. Mm -hmm. If that still doesn't result in anything, I would like to consider taking that money back and putting it in the general NOFA. Um, if, if the updated criteria still doesn't get those dollars out on the street to create housing. I'd like to consider at least have a discussion about that. I would ask a uh, board member Mono if, if that's the case, we as staff would love to come back with options of other ways we might be able to utilize those funds if that's acceptable with what you're providing as direction. Yeah, I mean wait and see if the wait and see if the updated criteria actually work. Yeah. But if it if not. If it if it doesn't work then let's have a discussion yeah. on it. Okay. I'm, I'm all right with that. Sounds good. Okay. Yes. Any other announcements? Danny? That is it for us. Thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now on number nine, report of the chair and the vice chair. Mr. Chair, any announcement? No announcements from my side. Thank you. All righty. We have one announcement clarifying the uh, scripter's error for the RDA budget amendment. Uh, and I think that's probably the first time I've ever used that word in my life. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not a financial person, but that's called a, that's a clerical error for all you people who are like me. Uh, after the board's adoption, here's my announcement. After the board's adoption vote in November, finance determined the $6.4 million should have been a negative amount instead of a positive amount because the funds had not yet been transferred to the RDA as shown in the fiscal year 2024 annual budget. The budget amendment is basically canceling the transfer of funds, and the use, of remain, the use remains the same as part of the RDA's affordable housing NOFA. This can be corrected as a Scribner's error, aka clerical error, since the intent was clearly discussed at previous board briefings, and the resolution recording and signature process have not yet been finalized. Finalized finance provided an update budget spreadsheet showing the change and it's included in today's meeting packet and in the public record. All righty. Any questions about that? We'll talk to the finance. <laughs> you can't answer the questions. <laughs> well, I don't know. You're looking for a motion? I don't think we need I don't think, no, we don't need a motion. Oh, okay, yeah, great. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just a clerical error. Okay. Yep. We have no re uh, written briefings, we have no consents, and we have no closed session. So we are adjourned. Thank you very much. And we'll meet back here at, Mr. Chair. Four. That's what's scheduled. Let's do four. At four o'clock. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.